Yes. Um, my name is Creep and I am an Extinction Rebellion activist from uh, London Actions and also from XR Greenwich. Um, and we're here today to talk about um, the UK government's approach to, to techno fixes um, and how they can actually damage the fight, the fight against, against climate change. So we've got two speakers for you today. Um, we have our very own Simon Parani, who has um, a lot of experience and, and written books on the subjects of um, fossil fuel and, and the damage that that ends up doing. And we also have Ellen Robottom joining us from uh, Leeds Tra Trades Union Council. Um, so they're each going to speak for about 15 minutes and then you will all have opportunities to ask questions afterwards. You can either put your hand up or you can stick them in the chat and we will I'll try and make sure that I don't that I don't miss anyone. Um, so if there are things that come up during, you can either put it in the chat then and there or just make a note of it and, and feel free to ask when they finish speaking. Um, is there anything else I should say before we begin? I don't think so. I'll tell you about our coming upcoming sessions at the end of, um, of this session. So I think probably the thing for me to do now is just to hang over to Simon to introduce himself and, and get cracking. Peter Good, I go first, but I, th I think we were going to have Ellen first. Oh, were you? Sorry, that's my, right. uh, my mistake. You don't, <laughs> Ellen, do you want to go first then? <laughs> it's probably better if I do. <laughs> So that I don't completely forget what I'm talking about. Okay. Just going to share the screen and I think that's the one. Can everybody hear me and see okay? Yep, you can. Right. Okay, so um I just this this first slide is just briefly explaining what um, leads trade union council is because i guess if, if you're not a trade union activist you might not be aware but it's it is it's delegates from the local branches so it is a, a very grassroots thing it's not a sort of a top down you know when you hear about the, the tuc on the on the in, in the, the news um they're talking about the trade union congress which is 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 a different thing obviously they're connected um but the trades councils are are local bodies that are made up from <clears throat> ordinary delegates from from the branches um and and that can um be significant because it can th there can be some differences of opinion within the trade union movement um now <clears throat> because although the the um, the Leeds project is a project to um, to try to get a um, a mass program of homes retrofitting, but because we're talking here about the dangers of of um, um, the sort of big techno fix um, kind of um, kind of green, greenwash things, I thought I'd start off by talking about the one that's going on in Leeds, um, which has already been mentioned. So it's the H21 project, uh, H standing for hydrogen. Um, so it's a consortium led by the Northern Gas Networks um, uh, with the intention of converting domestic gas supplies to hydrogen. And, and Leeds was essentially the, the, the kind of uh, test case um, and the, the place where they intend first rolling it out. Um, so yeah, uh, Leeds City Council is still not coming down on one side or the other about it. Um, it seems like they're quite in favour if, if only they, they can um, see a proper funding and policy framework put in place. So that's, uh, um, yeah, not, not very encouraging. Um, the point about this is that the backers um, of it, the corporate backers are arguing that it's, they're talking about making the UK a world leader in developing a hydrogen economy. So we're not just talking about um, pumping hydrogen into people's homes for their gas cookers and their central heating. It's all very in, um, intrinsically tied in with hydrogen for all kinds of other purposes. And um, importantly, um, they um, deep, supposed decarbonisation of the hydrogen using the technology of carbon capture and storage. And this is very, has a lot of implications in our region because we've got a huge amount of heavy industry. And then we've got the Drax power station, which is advertised itself as the um, um, actually um, sequestering carbon through its uh, biomass and carbon capture and storage programme, which uses wood chip. And actually it's anything but, it's a very, um, 
is, is, is a very high emitting process, um, given the way that the wood's sourced and, 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 and various things. So all these things are tied in together. And I think it's important to understand that that's where, where the hydrogen lobby is coming from. They're basically, they're, they're, they're looking to create um, a sort of global um, hydrogen based system, which is going to be hugely profitable, of course. Um, so just, just quickly on the technology, I'm sure probably Simon might say more about this, but the plan is, as I've said, to produce the hydrogen, um, well, from methane, which is the, the, the main component of natural gas. Um, it's done by a process called uh, steam methane reforming, um, which has large quantities of carbon dioxide as a byproduct. And then the plan is to pipe the carbon dioxide to carbon capture and storage facilities, uh, which are basically salt caverns under the North Sea. Um, and, and this is, although they talk about this only being an interim measure until uh, it becomes possible to produce clean hydrogen, uh, properly clean hydrogen from um, bypassing renewable electricity through water. Um, so uh, electrolysis of water, that's really, that's that's not the intention. If you look at the, the documents and the publicity uh, for the H21 project, it's all talking about it being uh, about giving a boost to carbon capture and storage and, 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 and that being a technology that's going to be supposedly widely adopted. It's very... Um, let's say, mendacious a lot of this publicity because it suggests that carbon capture and storage is already uh, in a technology that's already been widely rolled out. It hasn't at all. Um, it won't be available, if at all, it won't be available at any scale until the mid-30s. And, and even then, it's, it's not, you know, it's, it's unlikely to be a highly efficient technology. Um, Another problem with it, well, I've just mentioned that the, the time scale that um, uh, in, in, if you look at the H21 um, report, um, they're not intending to begin the domestic conversion to, uh, to hydrogen until 2028. It'll only see 3.7 million properties converted by 20, 2035 and 15.7 million by 2050. The UK has more than 27 million dwellings in the UK uh, that collectively account for around 20% of greenhouse gas emissions. Um, and that's mostly from heating and hot water. And I guess every, everybody in this meeting knows the importance of getting the emissions down within the next decade. It's, you know, we're, we're talking far too little too late with this project. <clears throat> and then there's the additional problem of fuel poverty, which this does nothing whatsoever to, um, to, to combat because it's just selling us another kind of gas that's going to be a bit more expensive. Um, so this is where we come Leeds Traits Council, um, decarbonising Leeds homes with a huge programme of deep retrofitting and installation of heat pumps. Um, so the document that I've put in the chat, the link that I've put in the chat goes into a lot more detail about the rationale for this, but essentially as I've said, the, the, the housing stock is responsible for about 20% of the country's greenhouse gas emissions and about three quarters of, of the energy used in homes is for heating and hot water. The other quarter is from appliances such as kettles and, and uh, TVs and all that. And, and they are becoming far more efficient. The appliances are becoming more efficient. Um, but the, the sticking point is the, the heating and the hot water. Um, what we do know is that excellent energy efficiency measures um, can reduce energy demand by up to 80%. So that's where you have to start. Uh, I mean, the amount that it can be reduced varies hugely depending on the, the type of property. Some homes are very, very easy to, um, to, to super insulate and, and, and draft proof and so on. And others are more difficult, but we're, we're, we're talking about an average here. Um, and, um, I've just put with good ventilation with an exclamation mark because that is one of the issues that can arise when you've got um, homes properly sealed and draft proofed. But that's the, there's, there's a lot of information that you can find about the um, the actual techniques of, of retrofit, um, and yeah, that's 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 easily come by. So um, I won't go into that in detail unless anybody wants to ask questions later on. Um, 
but it is important to understand that that it's it's taking a fabric first approach to the house. Uh, there's a lot of talk out there. The the, the majority of the um, the lobbying out there and the majority of the funding is really for energy technologies, for heating technologies, um, and, and, and far too little emphasis is being placed on actual energy efficiency, actually cutting the energy demand. Um, the reasons for this become very apparent that, that the energy technologies are where the, where the profit is to be made and, 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 and where the largest amount of obviously corporate lobbying is going on. Um, whereas reducing the energy demand of homes is, is it's a relatively low tech thing. It's something that can be done at scale without any massive corporations being, being even being involved in it. Um, it has to be done. We, we cannot meet emissions reduction targets without doing it and without doing it, without doing almost all of the homes and without doing them all properly. Um, one of the reasons for this is that if, we, if we're talking about um, going fossil free then we're talking about electrification of, 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 of homes and lots of other things as well so we're talking electrification of homes other types of buildings industry transport so many different things that are all competing for a very finite supply of renewably produced electricity i mean producing electricity by any method you like is uh, has its own environmental costs, there's extraction of, of, of minerals and other resources, there's the energy use involved in um, actually building the installations, the transportation of resources and all the rest. Um, so, um, yeah, vast quantities of renewable electricity will be needed for decarbonising industry and transport, so it's all the more important that we cut to a bare minimum the amount that's needed for, um, for, for domestic use and also that we um, try to reduce the, the dependency on the grid by using on-site um, electricity generation or by reducing the amount of electricity that's needed by um, heat pumps, for example, or a technology which transfers I've just written, done an explanation here as to what a heat pump is, but basically, uh, basically it's a fridge and what it does is transfer heat from um, from a colder environment into a warmer environment. So it takes heat either from the air or from the ground or even from, from water if you're near a river or something. Um, and um, it's used, it's passed over a refrigerant liquid, which is a liquid that vaporizes at low temperatures. Um, so you don't need a lot of, very minimal amount of heat um, needs to be put in. And then when you compress that refrigerant vapor, it causes that to heat up and that heat is then used to, to heat the home. Um, and as the heat passes into the home through whatever heat emitting system you've got, um, it then returns to being a liquid and, and so it continues. Um, it's one of the reasons why the fabric first approach is so important is also the fact that heat pumps actually don't work very well unless the, the home is very, very well insulated. Um, and it's got appropriate large heat emitting surfaces, such as extra large radiators, things like that. Um, and what's going on at the moment, of course, with these the, these sort of grants that are given to homeowners, that they, um, you just you've probably seen in your Facebook feed some of you and things like that. That there's, there are there are there are there've been millions of sort of, um, well, I was going to say cowboys, they're not necessarily, but but people that are trying to to sell these these um, these heating technologies, heat pumps and other things, um, to householders who haven't realised that, that the first thing they need to be doing is insulating. So they're sticking in um, heating technologies that actually aren't going to work in a house that hasn't been retrofitted. Um, of course, we know there's been other problems with, with the, um, the grant uh, scheme anyway, but we didn't go into that. Um, the other thing I want to quickly go is, is that I think I've, I've sort of hinted at it already, but um, we're talking here about energy democracy versus the control of energy by centralised corporate profit-seeking organisations. Um, so pathways based on energy efficiency coupled with renewably produced electricity and on-site or local generation 
lend themselves to dispersed community-owned and controlled systems that can place workers and households at the centre, don't necessarily but have the potential to do so, in contrast to the centralised corporate-owned and controlled but publicly subsidised infrastructure producing a, a product such as hydrogen for shareholder profit rather than the benefit of the public or the benefit of the, indeed, the benefit of the workforce. Um, just unmuted myself again. Yeah, so yeah, I think we, we're thinking in terms of hydrogen, carbon and capture and storage mania, which is um, being sponsored by, you know, the corporate, the corporate lobbyists who are desperate to, you know, not, not end up with a lot of people losing their investments in, in, uh, in fossil fuels. Um, This, this paper by the New Economics Foundation lends a lot of support to what we're saying. Um, it's actually about um, the re the economic recovery after COVID and, and, and a project for um, getting people back into work who've lost their jobs as a result of the pandemic. And they've actually um, used criteria that are very relevant here as to which projects they would um, advocate um, in the government should invest in as a sort of jobs and, and uh, economic recovery. Um, stimulus, the speed at which projects can begin, intensity of job creation, uh, re retrofit and building are the two, um, and, and building new homes are the two things that always come out at the top when you're talking about the number of jobs per unit of investment. Um, they, they are incre incredibly beneficial in terms of generating jobs. Um, and uh, but of course, building homes, it all very much depends on, um, on who's controlling that. We want council homes rather than um, sort of you know, Barrett houses or whatever. Um, yeah, the jobs, the, the, these are jobs that can, that, that can be local. So you can prioritize areas where the job losses have been the worst, where the poverty is the worst, where the uh, fuel poverty is the worst. Um, and also, a lot of this is work that can still be done under under conditions of social distancing. So that's yeah, that just backs up what we're what we're talking about. Um, and I'm just skipping here. Um, oh, the can see that I'm running out of time rapidly. But um, a national climate service is the way it, it it's it's um, the focus of um, another piece of work that I'm involved in which is by uh, it's a group called Campaign Against Climate Change, which has a trade union section. And they publish this, which is a pamphlet called One Million Climate Jobs, um, which this is, this is the last edition, which was actually published in 2014. And it's very out of date now, so, we're, so we are updating it. Um, but what this does, it's, it's, it's all about arguing that in transitioning to a low carbon eco economy, we don't need to lose jobs. We actually, can, uh, it, there's actually a huge amount of additional labor that's needed to actually make that transition. But we've got, it's got to be the right sort of transition. Um, so um, I've just this is just a quote from the updated version, which um, which some of us are working on, and and what we're arguing is that um, although there is a lot of benefit in in community led initiatives, cooperatives, you no know, community interest, small businesses, things like that, but for it to work at the scale and at the speed that's needed, it needs to be a public service like the health service, free at the point of use. None of this kind of, you know, piecemeal giving grants to homeowners, and obviously that's a badly targeted uh, system anyway. In terms of fairness and in terms of getting to the people in fuel poverty first, but also it's just not efficient enough. It's not fast enough. Uh, it won't get the job done. So we need a national climate service to coordinate all of this this stuff, um, and it will have to be paid for from progressive taxation rather than. Um, being paid by, by private householders and, and grants. Um, and to give you the, the results of our number crunching on the updated version, it's no longer 1 million climate jobs, it's something more like 3 million climate jobs. This is the amount of labour that's actually needed. Um, just in the, in, in the retrofitting buildings alone, this, this is what we've got. Um, the, 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 these, these are the numbers that we arrive at which is, as you can see, um, an additional 
two million jobs just for the on-site work. It's, well, mostly for the on-site work. And then in the supply chain, because what we will then need to do is to uh, is to have other industries for manufacturing, the heat pumps, the ventilation systems, the insulating materials, most of these currently are imported, um, which obviously isn't very good for the carbon um, footprint. Um, and also that a lot of the insulating materials that are being used are petrochemical based, so that's not great. Um, you know, so there's lots of work to be done also in manufacturing properly sustainable um, insulating products. So lots and lots of jobs in the supply chain as well, which is, you know, these are the things that are of interest to, to, to trade unions and also to local authorities. So um, that's where I'm going to end. Um, sorry if that's a little bit disjointed, but time for questions later. That was great, Ellen. Thank you very much. That was you were extremely punctual for, for what we normally get from our speakers. So I thank you very much for that. Um, I can see that we've already got quite a lot of questions in chat, which I'm making a note of. And um, we will come back to after after Simon's uh, told us what he would like to say. Um, so I'm just going to pass straight over to you now, if that's OK, Simon. Yep. So, uh, thank you very much, uh, Creep. Um, I'm going to I'm going to divide this into three bits. The first is just to ask the general question about how to think about technologies. The second is about uh, this uh, 10 point plan from the government. Uh, and I'll, I'll just end up uh, with a short bit at the end about some conclusions for action. Um, so the first thing about how to think about technologies, the first thing I want to say is I've got a languages degree I am not an engineer. Um, some people in my house would say that I struggle to fix a plug and stuff like that. Um, but nevertheless, I have tried to teach myself a bit about technology because I think to uh, talk about society without talking about technology makes no sense and vice versa. So that's the first thing. Um, so if we take a technology with, with that we're all talking about every day, which is the vaccine, um, so nothing directly to do with climate change. It's a relatively simple technology that's in, in terms of the, you know, you don't need a big machine to put it in somebody's arm. It's, it's, uh, it, it, it comes in small doses. Uh, it's been, and it's also simple in the sense that it's been developed from other similar technologies. They weren't starting from zero. They were starting from the knowledge that's been built up in medical science about uh, different coronaviruses. But there's a social and political context, which is very, very complex. So we've all uh, learned about vaccine nationalism. We've all learned about vaccine hesitancy. You know, communities who spent decades uh, getting the hell kicked out of them by the state. And then the state comes along and says it wants to stick something in their arm. And some people struggle with that vaccine hesitancy. Um, and in the UK, we've got a government that having spent the last year sabotaging uh, public health strategy has kind of come along with the vaccine. And uh, I, I mean, one of the ministers just couldn't resist uh, going on about how it was a British vaccine. And I don't think he said world beating vaccine because that particular phrase had been misused previously, but they brought it forward as a kind of bullet that's going to solve all problems. Whereas actually, if you read the independent sage or the sage that actually advises the government or listen to any of the scientists when they come on the news, vaccines work if they're part of a public health strategy. So don't open up... Uh, as they've been telling them for the last year, and don't open up Heathrow Airport, have your travellers walking through from Los Angeles, which is in the middle of an awful wave of a new uh, variant, uh, and think that you, know, you can sort all that out with a vaccine. You need a combination. So that's the first thing. You can't se separate, I would argue, society from technology. This, how, how do we work out our attitude to shifts in technology? Because that's certainly what uh, we're going to be dealing with in terms of the shift away from uh, fossil fuels. Um, we've, got to, we've got to take each technology, but then also consider it uh, in its uh, social and economic context. And uh, the, the example I had in my notes is exactly the one that Ellen's mentioned, which is 
uh, renewable electricity, which we all, I think, quite correctly see as probably the main, uh, one of the main technologies, which whichever way this all pans out is going to be needed. Um, but even in that case, it's not innocent. It's not, it doesn't come free. It doesn't come without problems. It doesn't come without a resource cost, specifically the uh, lithium and cobalt for batteries, the rare metals that are used in alloys to build uh, the wind turbines, and that stuff all uh, has a resource cost. A lot of it comes from the global south, uh, and uh, there are a lot of money-making companies that are working out how to loot the global south for that stuff, just, they've, just like they've looted it for other stuff uh, in the past. So, um, we, we've always got to be aware of that. And I think also always to be aware, there is no technology which isn't shaped by uh, the society. And I mean, just to give another example, uh, something we all use every day is the internet. And of course, uh, the pioneers of the internet envisages a simple low traffic system for communication. Uh, and of course it has opened up communication in a way that uh, we couldn't dream of 40 or 50 years ago. But uh, because it's controlled by big corporations, um, it means that, first of all, it's developed along a certain direction. It's developed as this huge information gathering and advertising machine. Um, and it's also actually uh, now uh, the Internet uses more electricity than any country except the top five, more than India, right, with its one billion uh, population. So it didn't need to go that way. It could have gone a different way but it went the way it did because of the society uh, we live in. So society and technology have to be considered together. And also I would say that in the day and age we live in, uh, we've got to think in terms of technological systems. So to give an obvious example of something we've been thinking about a lot in XR Greenwich because of being involved in the campaign about the Silvertown Tunnel, it's not just the cars. The cars are part of a whole system. That is the cars, especially the SUVs, but it's the whole system which is based on cars. Cities don't have to be built uh, to suit the cars, um, to make way for the cars. Uh, they've been built that way because of uh, what we might call car culture and uh, car economics. So uh, again, uh, it's that uh, society and uh, technology. Now I'm going to try and share my screen and go on to the second bit. The second bit is about this uh, 10 point plan, which has been mentioned by the government as its uh, answer. And I mean, this is you know patently the preparation of the government for the climate talks at the end of the year in Scotland. Uh, they're going to be hosting, they want to be seen to be doing something. I've just put a couple of quotes from uh, some of the researchers, the climate scientists at the top, passes the buck, the plan passes the buck of mitigating climate change to another government, several electoral cycles down the line. Um, and then uh, Nick Ayer, <laughs> being slightly more polite than the climate scientists, uh, but still pretty devastating in his way. It reads like a shopping list of interesting technologies that might be grafted onto the existing energy system. And I mean, the points are there. I'm not, I've just taken this from a government document. I'm not going to go through them one by one. Um, you can see them up there. Um, the, the, uh, so the, the, to my mind, they could, you could sort of group these in three. First, technologies that most of us who care about climate change and social justice are opposed to out of hand. Uh, carbon capture and storage, Ellen's uh, talked about that. Nuclear would be another one. And uh, I mean, just... Remember, there are different reasons for opposing these things. Uh, the carbon capture and storage is uh, bad because of its connection with the fossil fuel industry. Uh, the enormous, uh, if you had the green hydrogen, the one done by the electrolysis of water, just the incredible energy cost. The, you know, if you have that amount of renewable electricity, you could do something else with it, like send it to everybody's home to work an electric heat pump. Um, and, you know, why would you make hydrogen with it? Um, but with nuclear, there are different issues. And of course, opposition to nuclear is something that's been traditional among environmentalists and the labor movement going back much further because we don't like stuff that's basically 
you know, inherently kind of connected to the military um, and can't really exist uh, outside of that uh, connection. So that's, that's two of the things that would give me problems with this uh, 10 point plan. Um, then there's other technologies that in my view may play a part in a decarbonized energy system but are not magic bullets. So uh, electric cars here, this is a, a, a big, it's probably the biggest um, uh, item on this uh, little shopping list that the uh, Prime Minister has put together. But, uh, and I mean, I actually thought Greenpeace and, and, and the Labour Party for that matter were unreasonably um, warm in their uh, response to this uh, 10 point plan because they all sort of latched onto the electric cars and said that's a great thing now i mean i do think and hope that you know my grandsons when they grow up if they need to go somewhere in a car for some reason it's going to be electric but it's not a magic bullet um and electric cars at the moment are generally i mean they're incredible swathe of figures but you know probably in this country you probably get about half uh, the amount of carbon emissions per kilometre you've travelled in an electric car uh, than you do in a petrol car. But half is not zero, especially when the middle classes are going out and buying electric SUVs, and especially when the government, which has put, I don't know, it's a few tens of millions of pounds in this plan for electric cars, not a lot compared to the 27 billion uh, that's going into the new uh, road building program. Now, the third thing on this list is there are some technologies that in principle you'd think uh, we would welcome. And uh, I think probably my favourite one here is greener buildings, because as Ellen said, why would you want to, uh, uh, why would you want to go to all the effort of putting your heat, you know, if, if we once nixed the idea of this uh, mad hydrogen for homes project, and then the engineers and uh, and uh, builders of Leeds uh, get the boost that Ellen's hoping for and they go around and put a heat pump in everybody's house. Not a lot of use if you haven't first insulated the homes, right? So greener buildings, you'd, you'd look down the list and you'd, you'd think, great. However, I, this is another thing about technologies, the devil's always in the detail. And if you just go as I did to the uh, Architects Journal uh, webpage, those architects are not impressed, to put it mildly. Uh, they say that, first of all, um, it, it, there's something good, which is that, that there's a little more power for local authorities to set their own standards, although the government could uh, sit on that in future. Um, they say that uh, the embodied emissions in construction are not included, and that's very bad. So to translate that from the jargon, that's the emissions that are produced by producing the cement, the bricks, the glass, the steel, and everything else that these days goes into buildings. Uh, those have been excluded from the counting mechanism that the government uh, uses, and the architects are furious. And I mean, as with the transport researchers and as with all sorts of other uh, researchers, they're furious because they've been saying this, you know, not you know, two months ago when the Prime Minister woke up and decided to do this 10-point plan, but for years and years and years and years. Um, they say there are no details about retrofitting existing buildings in this 10-point uh, plan. Uh, the reference to greener buildings is the new buildings, but new buildings is not the big problem. And I think Ellen's already uh, explained that um, in some detail. Uh, the architects don't like the fact that the standard for new buildings will not come in until 2025. And at least some of those architects uh, were, were speaking out about the fact that this is to do with the government's relationship with construction companies and property developers. Um, so uh, just going quickly on, um, what I want to say about the plan is there are people, and Ellen's actually given us the example of the One Million Climate Jobs Plan, and that's one of, of a number of uh, plans that have been put together by people who are thinking about how you could take a holistic approach to uh, 
reaching uh, an economy that has no fossil fuels in it. And it, it, as Nick Ayer said here, the plan reads like a shopping list of interesting technologies. So there are various groups of people who've, who've uh, produced holistic plans. So just uh, this is one, the Center for Research on Energy Demand Solutions. I, it starts with the government's net zero targets, which to tell you the truth makes me a bit nervous. I think those targets are far short of what's needed, but it's a serious job of work. They've looked at all the technologies. They've thought about how they could get rid of the fossil fuels out of the system. You know, they're, 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 at, um, they're based at, I forget now, one of the big universities, and it's worth having a look at. This is another one. This is from the University of Cambridge. Uh, they've said, no, we're not interested in net zero. We want absolute zero. Then they're not so, uh, they haven't set a particular time scale, but what they have said is, can this be done without anything new being invented? Because, you know, if you listen to the prime minister, it's all about great new things that are going to be uh, invented. And they say you can do this with existing technologies. And, and I mean, the Leeds example is a great one. You know, it's about patching people's homes up and, and stopping the hot air going out into the cold air. It's about um, it, it, it's about fitting heat pumps and working out how to do that cost effectively. Uh, what Dominic Cummings called boring. Um, and uh, so that's an, and this is another one, the Center for Alternative Technology. They're a, a center, uh, you know, coming out of the tradition of environmentalism going right back to the 70s. Um, so there are a number of these things. I mean, you know, I, I could, there's no time, but I mean, I could run through any of these and say, well, there's some things are like and some not, but the point is about all of them, they've got a holistic approach. They're looking at the whole problem, the whole system. And that, that's just a page from the one uh, that the uh, Central Alternative Technologies on Transport. Those are really easy to find, I've just got them off the internet. Okay, so conclusions. First, holistic approaches are vital, and very often it's the political and economic setup that is the main obstruction to those holistic approaches. And again, I think the, the example Ellen's given us is a good one. Um, second point, we need to ask uh, how those relationships of wealth and power shape the technologies, how the technologies um, can shape those relationships also. Uh, but so again, um, yes, I, I, I believe that renewable electricity is the way we've got to go. But I don't think it's a bullet and I don't think it's free of problems. And finally, we need to prioritize the technologies that can achieve drastic cuts in emissions quickly. And as Ellen said, and I completely agree, and I, I, you know, there's piles of academic reports on this, uh, the massive savings you could make by patching up people's homes. Um, I mean, researchers often talk about demand reduction, and I've decided I don't like using those words because that sounds as though we're asking you know, people, you know, old ladies to turn their heat down maybe in the winter because uh, that's reducing demand. So, I mean, that is the phrase that's very often used, but I, I think, you know, let's think of a better one, uh, reducing throughput of energy. I think one of those documents I put up uses the phrase powering down. Anyway, whatever we call it, uh, it means that without using these phenomenal quantities of energy that are pumped into this system, uh, we can get the same results in terms of heating people's homes or making sure the internet's on so that uh, you know the kids can do their homework or you know whatever it is we need to use the energy for uh, at the end of the uh, system so i'll stop there uh, thanks thank you very much simon um my head's spinning so much information <laughs>